Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. If you would, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Certainly it's good to be here. Appreciate all you that have uh, come to this lectureship. Appreciate the invitation. And also the theme of the lectureship, uh, much needed in our world today. We need to be talking about Christian evidences. We need to, to be able to defend the topics that we're going to be discussing today because many people are either skeptical, agnostic, or atheistic. And uh, we need to get people back to God and the Bible. Uh, our, our world, our nation uh, is in turmoil because we have rejected God in our knowledge. And so this is a, really a timely lectureship, and I appreciate uh, the invitation to be part of it. In 2 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And if you would, also turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, the Bible claims of itself to be inspired of God. It claims that it did not have its origination with men, but it was the product of the Holy Spirit working through men. And that's the topic of our discussion this morning, evidences for the inspiration of the Bible. The Bible, of course, is arranged as 66 books divided in two parts, Old and New Testament. We're all fully aware of that. Uh, the entire Bible fits together perfectly. And it... And it tells the account of man's fall in sin and then the plan of God to save man from the consequences of that sin through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to save us from our sins, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1-4. through 4. And that's what the Bible's about. And that theme is perfectly carried out. There's perfect unity throughout the Bible, even though it was written by approximately 40 different men over the course of about 1,600 years. These men were from various backgrounds. I don't need any help, but you can turn that up. Are we ready? Can you hear me? All right. So, uh, again, the, the unity of the Bible, written by 40 different men over a period of about 1,600 years, perfect unity. These men were from various backgrounds, nationalities, countries, different situations in which they wrote. And all of them worked together, never contradicting one from another. Now imagine if we had 40 different architects over the period of 1,600 years designing a building such as the Empire State Building. Do you think we would have that kind of unity and harmony in the construction of that building? Think of the advancements in architecture, in building materials, in different aspects of workmanship that would change over 1,600 years. Now, friends and brethren, we have different men from different backgrounds, in different situations, writing about the same theme, and they never once contradicted. See, that's a, a good evidence for inspiration right there. There's no other explanation for the unity of the, of the Bible other than the fact that it originated with God and the Holy Spirit, as Peter says, worked through men to produce the things that they wrote. But think about our lesson. The question we want to answer is this. What makes the Bible different from all other books in the world? You know, there's no other book like the Bible. There's no other book like it. There's a lot of other books that claim to be of divine origin, but are not. They do not stand up to the scrutiny that the Bible does. 
Think about it. The Bible has been under scrutiny of skeptics for hundreds of years. There have been many attacks against the Bible. But it's still here. It's still here. And that's because it can stand the test of that scrutiny since it is inspired by God. No other book can make that claim. That's why the Bible is different. We think about Bible inspiration. What is inspiration? Well, look at the Greek and English. The English word comes from a Latin, and it simply means to breathe into. Well, the Greek word goes further than that, and it ties the breath, the breathing into, back to God. It's a compound word that means that, that it's literally God breathed. And so God breathed into those that wrote the Bibles, the human authors, He breathed into them the message that they wrote. And that's, the, that's really the idea of inspiration. <clears throat> and as we've seen, the Bible talks about its own inspiration, the text that we just read at the beginning. And since the Bible is God-breathed, then it, it would make sense that it would be free from error in its original form. Now I say in its original form because I'm talking about the original authored manuscripts. We use translations today. And if you're familiar with translations, all you have to do is set three or four or five side by side and you're going to find some problems that exist between the various translations. And so there may be some problems with some of our English translations, but those issues did not exist in the original manuscripts. They were perfect in every way. They were without fault. They were accurate in everything that they said. So the Bible is free from error in the original form. The writers of scriptures did not make any factual, historical, scientific, or any other kind of error in the transmission of the Bible. The Bible does not claim to be a textbook on history or science or mathematics or, or a textbook in any field like that. But when the Bible speaks to those topics, and it does quite frequently, the Bible is accurate in everything that it says. It's been proven time and again to be accurate. Again, this speaks to the inspiration of the Bible. Men's writings, if it's written and originates with mankind, an author that is without inspiration, we can find many errors in what's written. Okay? That's because we're human, right? And we're prone to mistakes. We make mistakes. Have, I, have anybody here made mistakes? I made a mistake one time. I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. See? So even I can make a mistake. <clears throat> but we need to prove inspiration. It doesn't do us any good to claim that the Bible is inspired if we can't prove it. You can, you can say any book is inspired, but then the question comes back, well, is it really inspired? And can we put other books to the test the way we're going to put the Bible to the test today? There's two sources of evidence regarding Bible inspiration. There's what we call external evidence for inspiration, such things as historical uh, documentation of biblical people, places, and events. And then we have uh, also archaeological artifacts that support the biblical documents. And then we have what we refer to as internal evidence from within the actual text of the Bible itself. This includes statements in the Bible which show that the actual existence of the scriptures cannot be explained in any other way except to acknowledge that they are of divine origin. The unity of the Bible is a good example of internal evidence, as we just mentioned in our introduction. Well, let's look at the factual accuracy of the Bible. The Bible claims, of course, as we mentioned, to be inspired by, the, uh, by God. And since God knows everything, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, He's omniscient, He's all-knowing. Since God knows all, it's reasonable to say that anything that He produces, such as the Bible, 
that it would be free from error. And that's reasonable. That's reasonable to say that. The factual accuracy of the Bible confirms that it is inspired. Time and, and, and by the way, speaking of time, I was going to say time and time again, the Bible's come under the scrutiny of skeptics about its accuracy and some of the statements. But given the time, I only have 40 minutes. Now I could spend on each subtopic that I'm going to discuss, such as the accuracy of the Bible, I could spend a whole sermon on, on that and maybe a whole series of sermons and still not cover everything there is out there. And so I'm going to talk about the accuracy of the Bible, give you some examples, then we're going to have to move on. Okay, because we just time limit will not allow us to cover this as uh, thoroughly as we would like under each topic. All right, so let me give you an example. In Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1, Isaiah mentions King Sargon of the Assyrians. So Isaiah says that king, there's the, there's the Assyrian nation and there is a king of the Assyrians named Sargon. This is the only mention of that in the Bible. And for many centuries, this was the only mention of Sargon being associated with the Assyrians, even, uh, the Assyrians, even in secular history. There's just no mention of it except right here in Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1. And so the skeptics, the people that, that want to discredit the Bible and say, well, it's not inspired because here's an error. And if God's perfect and knows everything, Isaiah couldn't have made this error. So we don't have any evidence of Sargon being associated with the Assyrians. Well, guess what? Guess what? In 1843, so all the way back to the writing of Isaiah, all the way up to 1843, no mention of Sargon being associated with the Assyrians. But there was a fellow by the name of Paul Emile Bata. He's a French counselor, agent at Mosul, and he unearthed historical evidence that established Sargon as having been exactly what Isaiah had said he was, the king of the Assyrians. And so it... Uh, Corsabad, Bada discovered Sargon's palace. And it's in the history books now. It's in archaeological review. It's in, it's in uh, Bible handbooks. You can see pictures of it. And so here's the critics. Oh no, the Bible can't be inspired because Isaiah made a mistake. And here we go. Archaeology, evidence external to the Bible, comes back and proves exactly what Isaiah said. In fact, this is the case every time we have a discrepancy between what the Bible says and what history says. Sooner or later, evidence comes forth to prove the Bible right every time. Here's, a, here's another example. In the New Testament, uh, Luke in the book of Acts, mentions over 40 countries and even more cities and islands and continents and regions and countries. I, I, we already said countries, but pardon me. But there's a fellow by the name of Sir William Ramses. He was a world-renowned archaeologist. And he would read through Luke's account in the book of Acts and he would say that that's nothing more than 2nd century. Now get this, he would say it's 2nd century fiction. That Luke's account of the places and times and events recorded in the book of Acts is nothing more than 2nd century work of fiction. Now, in the decades since, Ramsey, digging through the evidence, quite literally digging up some of the evidence, 
came to the conclusion that Luke was one of the greatest historians ever, and those that followed Ramsey claimed that Luke's account in the book of Acts is the most accurate historical document of those times. And so we've gone from Luke didn't know what he was talking about to Luke being the greatest historian of those times and those places ever. That's what archaeology does to the Bible every time. Always confirms it. Both Old and New Testament are trustworthy historical documents. Archaeologist Joseph Free said archaeology archaeology has confirmed countless passages which had been rejected by critics as unhistorical or contrary to known facts but archaeology comes along proves the bible right and the critics wrong every time jewish archaeologist archaeologist nelson uh, uh, gluck said that it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery ever contravened or contradicted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. Now that's a, a Jewish person is not a friend of Christianity. But here he is being honest in his field of study in archaeology. And he's stating the fact that the Bible in its entirety is accurate. Now if he's going to say that the archaeology proves the Old Testament accurate, he's going to have to say the same thing about the New Testament. And there goes Judaism. If he accepts the inspiration of the New Testament, he needs to give up Judaism. But at least he's honest in his field of study and affirms that the Bible is exactly what it claims to be. Bible critics said that Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, because writing was largely unknown in his day. There wasn't a sophisticated system of writing available to Moses for him to be able to write the Pentateuch. But guess what? Archaeology has proved otherwise by the discovery of many other written codes of the period. The Code of Hammurabi, the Light Ishtar Code, and the laws of the uh, Ishmuna, whatever that is. I, I think I'm saying it right. But friends and brethren, Archaeology, once and again and again, proves the Bible right. Critics used to say uh, that the Hittite nation didn't exist. The Bible talks about the Hittites. But we don't have any record of the Hittites. The Bible's got to be wrong. Well, here we go, 1906. Guess what they found? They found the ruins of the Hittite nation. And they found, through the discovery of this nation, that it was a huge nation. And very influential in his time. Guess what? That's just what the Bible says. Dr. G.R. Uh, Habernas points out that within 110 years of Christ's crucifixion, approximately 18 non-Christian sources mention more than 100 facts, beliefs, and teaching from the life of Christ and early Christians. These items mentioned almost every major detail of Jesus' life, including miracles, the resurrection, and his claims to deity. <clears throat> Liberal scholars said Nazareth didn't exist at the time of Jesus. Archaeology has proved otherwise just a few decades ago. Gospel portrayals of the temple, Pilate's court, Jesus' crown of thorns, the mode of his execution, have all been confirmed to the last detail, and we could go on and on. But that's external evidence. Let's look at some internal evidence. Prophecy, fulfilled predictive prophecy, is probably one of the most compelling sources of evidence for Bible inspiration. And by the way, I'm going to step on 
David Brown's toes a little bit and get to his lesson on the deity of Christ. Because when you talk about predictive biblical prophecy, what are you going to do? <laughs> You're going to talk about some of the things that were prophesied and look at the fulfillment. But I'm going to try to stay out of that as much as possible. Fulfilled prophecy is impressive internal evidence. The Bible is inspired word of God. It should contain such valid predictive prophecies. The fact that the Bible prophesies completely uh, foretold to the minutest detail and fulfilled with the greatest precision has confounded the critics of the Bible for generations. They cannot get over this. The critics of the Bible, they may nitpick and say, well, Isaiah mentioned Sargon and, and he, there was no Sargon. Well, they can nitpick all of that they want, but this is what we would like to call uh, technically, it's ungetoverable, right? The Bible contains numerous prophecies about individuals, nations, cities, and, and even the Messiah. In order for prophecy to be valid, it must meet certain criteria. I'm going to suggest three. I've seen other lists that contain maybe five or six, but these three are absolutely necessary. It must involve proper timing. In other words, it must be predicted in, in advance, far enough in advance, that the one doing the predicting cannot influence the outcome. So it has to be far enough in the future. You know, Joseph Smith claimed to be a prophet and his prophecy was that there was going to be a civil war in the United States. Well, if that was uh, sufficient to, to uh, make somebody a prophet, then every newspaper in the Union uh, would be a prophet because they all said the same thing. They all predicted it. It came to pass. But see, not sufficient timing. See, not enough advance uh, notice. Uh, Specific details, not vague generalities or remote possibilities. Has to be specific details. Bible prophecy, sometimes a, a specific individual's name is mentioned or a nation is mentioned. It's very specific in, in, in what's going to happen and how it's going to come to pass. And then there must be exact fulfillment. Not merely a high degree of probability, but exact fulfillment. Prophecy of the Bible fit these standards exactly. Let me give you an example. In Ezekiel chapter 26, verses 1 through 14, Ezekiel foretells the destruction of the city of Tyre. The prophet Ezekiel predicted that Nebuchadnezzar would destroy the city. Uh, verses 7 and 8, many nations would come up against it. Verse 3, it would be uh, leveled and scraped clean like a a bare rock, verse 4, its stones, timbers, and soil would be cast in the sea, verse 12. Uh, the area would become a place for the spreading of fishermen's nests, verse 5. The city never would be rebuilt to its former glory, verse 14. And history records that each of these predictions came true. Tyre was a coastal city from ancient times and, and had a rather unusual arrangement. The main city was on the coastline, but about three quarters of a mile offshore there was an island which was the rest of the city. And so in 332 B.C., I'll uh, go back a little bit. Before that, Babylon, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, comes against it and besieges the city on the coastline for 13 years and finally conquers that city. But when he gets inside the city, lo and behold, everybody's left the city and gone to the island. So it's kind of a hollow victory. But later on in 332 B.C., Alexander the Great comes along uh, and this is what he does. He takes the rubble from the coastal city and takes that rubble, just like the prophet said, and casts it into the sea and makes a land bridge out to the island and he whoops up on that island pretty good, but he doesn't defeat it. Okay. Remember, part of the prophecy is many nations are going to come against uh, the, the city of Tyre. So he builds this land branch. There's all the stuff from Tyre cast into the sea. There's the land bridge. In fact, that land bridge is still there today. 
Tyre later fell under the rule of the Romans and, the, uh, and those of the Crusades. And then in 1291, the Muslims come and finally wipe out the city. So here we have in detail that prophecy given and fulfilled in every way. Now it took about 1900 years for this prophecy to be fulfilled. Now how did, how did the prophet know 1900 years what was going to come to pass in the city of Tyre? Now this is all a matter of historical record. We have the prophecy and the fulfillment in great detail. Both the prophecy and the fulfillment in great detail. How do we explain that other than inspiration? There's no other explanation than inspiration. Then we get into messianic prophecies. A messianic prophecy is one that tells about a coming Messiah or Savior. These prophecies were written uh, to tell the world about a man who would come to save mankind from their sin. Now we think about the prophecies. I'm just going to run through some. I'm going to give you the prophecy the reference, and then I'm going to give you the reference where it was fulfilled. We're not going to read these, but you can write them down if you'd like. And like I said, I don't want to get into David's lesson too much. But this is, there's about 60 or more major prophecies, not, not counting the, the smaller ones, but major prophecies regarding the Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled every one of them. That's one of the strongest proofs for the deity of Jesus Christ, the Messiahship of Jesus. All right. And so the prophecies about the Messiah said that he would be rejected and no grief, Isaiah 53 and verse 3, that he would be betrayed by a friend, Psalms 41 and verse 9, and he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12. Well, these are all fulfilled in the New Testament, John 13 and verse 18, and Matthew chapter 26 and verse 13. Again, prophecy fulfillment, many hundreds of years between. The Bible in the Old Testament says that he would be sped upon and beaten. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6, also in chapter 53 and verse 5. And in death his hands and his feet would not be uh, or would be uh, pierced. Psalm 22 and verse 16. And this exactly what happened. Matthew 27 and verse 30. Luke 24 and verse 39. Although he would die and be placed in a borrowed tomb, Isaiah 53 and verse 9, uh, fulfilled in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 through 60. His bones would not be broken. Psalm 34, verse 20, John 19 and verse 33. His flesh would not see corruption because he would be raised from the dead. Psalm 16 and verse 10 fulfilled Acts 2, verse 22 through 24. And eventually he would ascend into heaven. Psalm 110 verses 1 through 3. Chapter 45 verse 6. And that's fulfilled in Acts 1 verses 9 and 10. These prophecies of course were written hundreds of years before they came true. But Jesus fulfilled every one of them in detail. This establishes him as the Savior of the world, and the Bible is the inspired Word of God. When we prove the deity of Christ, we prove the inspiration of the Bible. If we prove the inspiration of the Bible, we prove the deity of Christ. Can't have one without the other. Time and again, Bible prophecies are presented and fulfilled with exacting detail. In Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 9, it says, When the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one from whom the Lord has truly sent. The prophet's message comes to pass not because he's smart or that he figures something out that nobody else could, but it comes to pass because God told him so. Only God can tell the future. If the Bible accurately predicts the future, and it does, its author must be God. Now I want to move on to scientific foreknowledge of the Bible. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. I might make it. Scientific foreknowledge. Now this, is, this has always fascinated me. It's always fascinated me that the, the things that these people knew, sometimes 
thousands of years before we figured it out and proved it. I remember sitting down with uh, a couple of Mormon so-called elders and went through some of these evidences. And, you know, the Book of Mormon has some scientific things in it too. Like if you bury steel or iron in the ground, it'll preserve it, right? That's, that's the, the scientific knowledge of the Book of Mormon. Bury iron in the ground, it's going to... What happens? Have you ever dug up an old piece of iron out of the ground? What's it look like? Is it shiny and new and preserved? Nope. It's old and rusty and decayed. Right? Well, let's look at this. Another proof of inspiration is the unique scientific foreknowledge. From anthropology to zoology, the Bible presents astonishingly accurate scientific information that the writers on their own could not have known. From the field of oceanography, long ago Solomon wrote, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full under the place where the river goes, thither they go again. Now, this statement taken by itself may not seem profound at first glance, but when considered with additional evidence and other biblical passages, it becomes remarkable that Solomon made this statement. For example, you know, he's talking about rivers running into the sea and they don't fill up. One river, take the Mississippi River, for example, six million gallons, a little over six million gallons of water per second empty into the Gulf of Mexico. But the Gulf of Mexico stays at a constant level. How do we explain that? What's the, it's hydraulics. It's hydrology. It's the water cycle. You have what? You have evaporation. See all that water in the Gulf of Mexico evaporates. Where does it go? Up in the cloud. That's condensation. You see that cloud? It's condensation. What, what happens when you have a heavy cloud? Then you have precipitation. So we have the water go down into the Gulf of Mexico. It evaporates. Which way is the wind blowing the Gulf? Out to sea or away from the sea? Well, most of the time we're most away from the sea unless the storm's coming. Where's those clouds go? It goes back inland. And they get heavy and it rains. Where's the water go? Back into the rivers. Where does it go? Back. See, that's why it doesn't ever fill. That's why it doesn't ever get full. That's why it doesn't ever run over. That's why we don't have floods unless we have excess rain. That's the answer. You know, Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 3, the first part of that verse states that if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. There's the water cycle. Amos 9 and verse 6, the last part of that verse, He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is His name. God set it up that way. How did Solomon know that? You know, we didn't figure this out for, for hundreds of years. More than 2,000 years later, we finally get an understanding. Mankind finally investigates and through scientific research comes up, hey, this is how that works. Yet Solomon and Ecclesiastes wrote all about it. How did he know? Only explanation. Only explanation is God. God told Noah to build an ark. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 15. The dimensions, 300 cubits long, 50 cubits uh, wide, 30 cubits high. This is a ratio of 30 to 5 to 3, length, width, to height. Until 1858, the ark was the largest seagoing vessel on record. Conservative estimates available for the uh, for a cubit or 17 and a half to 18 inches. The art would have been 450 feet long, one and a half footballs long, football fields long, and would have contained about 1.5 million cubic feet of space. Well, in 1844, uh, found a fellow by the name of Brunel built a giant ship called the Great Britain, and he. Had he constructed it 
to almost the exact ratio of the arc, 30 to 5 to 3. As it turns out, the dimensions represent the perfect ratio, the perfect ratio of building a seagoing vessel. Now there you go. How did Noah know that? Well, God told him. God told him the perfect, the perfect dimensions. From the field of, of physics, Moses stated in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them finished is a verb indicating an action completed in the past. In other words, it didn't begin in the past and continue. It was finished. What does that do to evolution? That's just contrary to what evolution says, that, that it's an ongoing process. That's exactly, when we think about this idea of it is finished, that's exactly what the first law of thermodynamics states often referred to as the law of conservation of energy and matter, and it states that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. It was created once, and that's all there is, folks. That's all there is. In three places in the Bible, Hebrews 1.11, Isaiah 51 in verse 6, Psalm 102 in verse 26, the indication is given that the earth is like an old shirt that is wearing out. Now this is exactly what the second law of thermodynamics states. The law, also known as the law of increasing entropy, governs all processes. There is not a single known exception to this law. The law states that as time progresses, entropy increases. And entropy, entropy means that things become more disorderly, more random, more unstructured. Now by the way, if we look at evolution that says that you go from chaos to organization this says we go from organization to chaos again the Bible absolutely contradicts what common scientific knowledge holds to be true I'm going to stick with the Bible because it's inspired in other words a flower blooms fades and dies. A child grows to adolescence, adulthood, uh, uh, senility, and then dies. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm getting older, right? Everybody gets older. Uh, some people's hair turns gray. Some people's hair turns loose, right? Gravity takes over. My chest has fallen, right? I'm tired sometimes. I didn't used to get tired. That's entropy. My house, if I build a house today, what's it going to be like in 500 years? Jesus said, store not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust corrupts. That's entropy. How does the Bible record these things? Accurately. Before they're ever known. The field of medicine, we could go through that. Life is in the blood. Leviticus 17, verse 11 through 14. The Bible, science has proven that. The Bible carries hemoglobin to the cell. That gives life to the body. But you know what? We didn't always know that. We used to think that, that the blood, when somebody got sick, it, it, it had evil vapors in it. And so what we would do, we would cut people and bleed them to get the bad blood out. Do you know that George Washington died because of blood loss? He was sick and they were trying to bleed him and cure him and then they bled him to death? Yeah, but now we know better. Now we know better. Circumcision on the eighth day. Why the eighth day? Well, there's a, a chemical in, called thrombin, right? And that's what clots the blood along with vitamin K. And on the eighth day, there's 100 times more thrombin, uh, whatever that word is, in the bloodstream than any other time in the, in the life of a human being. That's the perfect time. That's the perfect time. Speaking of time, I'm out of time. Thank you for your time.